Welcome back to ESSA TV. Molly Harris Olsen is the CEO of Fairtrade Australia and New Zealand. Recognised for her leadership on sustainable business and development, Ms Olsen has convened, led and been a member of numerous boards, business leadership and sustainability initiatives, including the World Economic Forum's Global Leaders of Tomorrow. In 2014, she won the Australian Financial Review and Westpac 100 Women of Influence Award. Ms. Olson worked at the White House as the founding executive director of the President's Council on Sustainable Development, appointed by President Clinton in 1993. Ms. Olson, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. You have a double degree in economics and environmental studies. It's an interesting and quite powerful combination. What made you pursue economics and was there a determining moment when you realised that the economics of climate change was a field that you wanted to focus on? Actually, it's interesting that you say it's a powerful combination because at the time, my professors thought I was crazy. They said, look, choose one. You're never going to need both. So there was a, a very powerful moment when I decided uh, I was working on a campaign with a coalition of environmental organizations in the US. It was called the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, and it was the largest piece of conservation legislation ever passed uh, in the United States. And it was absolutely an enormous conservation um, achievement. But what I realized in that campaign was that all of the decisions around forestry, biodiversity, the fisheries, were all made on economic grounds. The decisions weren't being made on you know, what is necessary to protect the salmon, what is necessary to protect the biodiversity of this forest. Uh, and so I realized that if the decisions are all going to be made on economic grounds, I had to understand that language. So I actually then added that to my undergraduate um, and did a double degree. And it has been a very powerful combination. And we have to remember that that was uh, back in the early 1980s. Um, and the word sustainable development hadn't been coined yet. So Brundtland didn't um, come up with the word sustainable development, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs until 1989 or something, you know, with quite a few years later. So for me, it was kind of the early days of understanding there was a deep connection with these two sets of disciplines and that I really needed to do understand both in order to make an a impact on them. When encouraging businesses to implement sustainable policy, it's essential to look at the drivers of change. Fairtrade Australia New Zealand does this well by providing incentives for businesses to act sustainably. This approach is possible due to the rise of conscious consumerism. Why does it work so well and how can we further encourage conscious consumerism? What are some other incentives for businesses to adopt sustainable policies? other than reputation and branding? It's a very important question. And I think um, the reality that we've all come to is that creating a sustainable world is going to require every one of us, consumers, businesses, governments. Um, there's not one part of society that can actually solve this problem. It has to be all of us working in the same direction. And what we realized with companies, um, Fairtrade started its work 30 years ago to try to make trade fair because we realized that um, in fact, it was a farmer in Mexico. Uh, there were some wells being delivered uh, to a, it was a charity and they were bringing in wells and the wells were being put in this coffee cooperative. And the farmer said, thank you so much. We really appreciate these wells. But you know, if you just paid a fair price for our coffee, we could buy the well ourselves. And that was a sort of aha moment where we went, hmm, you know, there really are big structural reasons why poverty exists. And if we start to try to make trade fair, maybe we can change that. So fair trade has been phenomenally successful in that journey. And it is quite a powerful thing to be able to now be uh, about a 10 billion Australian dollars every year trade and retail sales globally in, in fair trade certified products across the world. Um, 11,000 different products, seven major commodities that are traded. So this is impacts for farmers that are just phenomenal. So the impact um, that we've had on, on people's lives has really been so exciting. Um, and I guess what I would say is our success is, is because of um, a couple of things. One is that we have a very robust, clear set of rules that define what is fair trade, what does it mean to play in this fair trade world and to have these benefits. 
And why is it that we are so rigorous about transparency in those supply chains and about auditing across them so that actually if you break those rules, you actually get decertified or delisted or you're not allowed to call yourself fair trade anymore. So we're a very robust, transparent system. And I think that um, that transparency and that clarity across what it is to be sustainable. So in the fair trade standards, there are protections for the farmers in terms of environmental health. Um, there are protections for gender, child labor, um, uh, um, climate change mitigation and adaptation. I mean, you name it, really. Across the whole sustainability spectrum, the standards actually help define what is going to help the farmers to enable trade to be fair for them. And the benefit for the companies is that they actually have long-term sustainable supply chains. They can feel good about what they're doing for tiny marginal differences in the way that they currently run their businesses and, and operate. They can actually have a profound impact in a positive way to support and enable farmers to have more control over their future, their families, their communities, and their lives. So it's it's a huge benefit to them. Um, I think that, that what we need to do to have more of it is actually, um, I mean, my, my um, my dream is that actually all trade will be conducted under fair trade terms. And if we could do that tomorrow, if I could ma wave a magic wand and, and make all trade adhere to the kinds of standards that fair trade has, the kinds of transparency and auditability across those supply chains that we have, we would have a, an infinitely more sustainable planet across all these important uh, attributes of sustainability. So I guess we can. What we need, though, is more companies that understand that long-term benefit um, for their own businesses and that we all share the planet. And it's up to all of us to actually make sure that um, we're increasing the sustainability for everyone. I read about your work on Rainbow Warrior, a Greenpeace ship used for protesting against whaling, seal hunting and nuclear waste dumping. You were fighting against BHP. It's very different to the kind of work you do now. What made you change your approach and why? It was a fantastic experience working with Greenpeace and running campaigns on the Rainbow Warrior. The Rainbow Warrior has done so many things, as have Sea Shepherd, to uh, try to make people think differently and bear witness to some of the really atrocious things that are happening in the world, whaling, uh, nuclear testing in the Pacific uh, amongst them. Um, so it was a real privilege to do that work. I was actually personally sued by BHP, uh, as was the skipper of the Rainbow Warrior in Greenpeace Australia as an organization, uh, during that particular campaign. We also shrouded the Japanese embassy in drift nets, for instance. Um, you couldn't do that today. You'd um, be risking your actual survivorship if you <laughs> went to an embassy and wrapped them in a drift net. So um, uh, I think that things have changed a bit. But for me, what was quite powerful at that time was we got incredible press, we had incredible public support, um, you know, lots and lots of high profile activity. But actually, when it came to BHP, it kind of um, solidified their view and it didn't actually help them understand why we didn't think whaling in a, uh, uh, oil drilling in a southern right whale calving ground was appropriate. Uh, the whales had only just come back into the area after decades of near extinction um, and why we believed that the oil drilling was inherently bad for them. Um, it, it didn't help them progress their understanding of sustainability issues in general. And I realized that actually it's important for organizations to raise awareness and to create um, uh, uh, an opportunity for the broader public to understand these issues. But actually, when it comes to changing companies and company behaviors, there has to be a method that also provides them um, an, an opportunity, which fair trade, I think, really does, to be part of the solution. And in this case, the only way that they could be part of the solution was to not do what they were doing, which I still believe was not appropriate. But um, with, with fair trade, it's actually looking on what are the solutions to some of these problems and how can we actually engage business in a way that enables them to be part of those solutions. In your time at the White House, as founding executive director of the President's Council on Sustainable Development, Al Gore was the US Vice President, and he was in a great position to influence change. Why do you think his 2000 presidential campaign was unsuccessful? Could it have been due to the public not being as receptive to climate change issues? 
It was a great privilege working in the White House. And in fact, I joined the campaign for Clinton because Gore joined the ticket. So it was actually when Al Gore, he had already written the book, uh, Earth in the Balance. I knew that very few politicians had any grasp of the real magnitude of the environmental challenges that faced us. And I thought, right, he's joining the ticket. You know, if he gets elected, we'll solve all these problems. And, you know, then I can go back to being, you know, kind of, uh, you know, having a normal life instead of this very, very active life. Um, I like an active life, mind you. But look, I think um, why his bid didn't work, I think it was a lot of different things. I think the number one reason um, is really the flaws in um, the voting system. I, I think it was the same with the uh, Hillary and Trump campaign. Um, in the United States, it's a first past the post, and then there's this strange electoral college. In both those elections, uh, Gore would have won and Hillary would have won if they had been doing that election in Australia, because we have preferential voting, mandatory voting, so everybody has to vote, and it enables more of the population to have their voice heard in the selection of the, the candidates. Um, so I think part of it is that Australia is just a much more democratic system um, and a, a much better electoral system. Um, I think that when he lost the bid, um, lots and lots of things changed. I mean, if he had won that bid in 2000, uh, I think the world would be in a very different place uh, from a climate point of view. And I, I think looking back on it in a hundred years, you know, that might have been, you know, the tragic loss that we suffered. I think that um, I'm hopeful, I'm always hopeful that we can actually um, um, address these issues like climate change constructively. And I think um, <laughs> that one of the things I love right now is that actually the companies in Australia are demanding that the government get their dang act together because from a business point of view, it doesn't help if the policies are changing all the time. Business wants surety. They want to know how to plan for the next, not three year cycle, but actually 30 year cycle. And for governments to keep doing these flip flops around this is not helping anybody. So I, I love the fact that now we've got businesses that are much wiser than our, our political frameworks and are actually pushing our, our governments to actually just get their act together and, and, you know, accept that already in the world today, renewables are um, a larger proportion of power that we're that we are using and it's much more cost effective and get on with it you know get over the coal stuff it's gone it's last century it's the century before that it's fine it's gone let's let it go to bed and let's move on with the things that are actually going to be more sustainable it, it's so obvious to most of us and um, it's it's just unfortunate that the political machinery is is a couple of decades behind even where business is how can the United Nations sustainable development goals? be successfully implemented and adapted to suit Australia? I'm really excited about the Sustainable Development Goals that the United Nations has um, got 193 countries behind. I mean, it is phenomenal. It's really almost, it's the first time in history that we've had so many countries that A, recognize and accept the range of problems and are identifying targets to make sure that there are solutions across all these countries. So if we compare them, for instance, to the Millennial Development Goals, which were a great thing, um, those were pretty much, um, we in the developed world are going to help you in the undeveloped world uh, fix your problems, and we're going to tell you how. It was a very kind of patronizing, sort of let us show you the way. The Sustainable Development Goals recognize overconsumption and obesity as biggest problems as poverty and you know we, we have these problems at the at this ends of these spectrums so all of this for me is very exciting because actually once all of us know what the problem is and we focus on what is this what is the, the target to change that and we start thinking about what are the solutions we actually I think we're capable I think humanity is capable of great great things. And so this enables us the, the framework for all of us to move in the same direction to try to solve these goals. With the Millennium Development Goals, we doubled the number of women in Parliament. We have the number of children in extreme poverty. We doubled the number of children in schools. There were many, many things on the global uh, you know, um, map that we changed dramatically, you know, the number of girls in school. So it, 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 we can do this if we put our minds to it and if we're working collectively. 193 countries if they really are committed and really do pull up their part of this challenge, we will um, see some really important changes in the world. And I think fair trade will be a critical part of that, by the way. What do you think are the biggest obstacles to significant climate change policy in Australia? 
And what do you think is the best way to approach this climate change policy? I think climate change is one of the biggest challenges humanity has ever faced. And I think um, it is hard for us to imagine, and, and really I think many people still don't believe that it's possible for us to have had this kind of impact, but we have. And all the evidence suggests it, and all the evidence suggests that the sooner we act to pull it back, the less uh, weather extremities we'll have, the, the less impacts we'll have on the planet. I think it's fascinating that uh, just recently we've had uh, not one, but two hurricanes back to back in the United States. I'm hoping that Trump understands that his climate policy is, is enabling these kinds of radical weather uh, events to, to amplify. Um, so I guess, what do we need to do? I think we need to unlock the power of uh, business and unlock the power of NGOs. We need to uh, try to get governments to be enablers for innovation and um, renewables. We need to try to stop governments that are getting in the way. And I'd say in the Australian government case, uh, we were the only nation backing George Bush for a decade when he stopped and delayed and delayed action on climate change. I think that is a disgraceful history for Australia. Uh, we are now fumbling and flip-flopping in ways that are just embarrassing globally for a policy, uh, you know, for a government to be flip-flopping like we are. I think we just need to get out of the way, let business get on with doing the right thing and, and, and creating a um, climate of sustainable energy production that will enable all of us to live a healthier and happier life. So I guess I think governments generally can be very helpful. When they are helpful, it's fantastic. Uh, if they're not going to be helpful, get out of the way. Because business is ready for this. Business knows that it's coming. Most business leaders, even, it was, was it back in 1992 or 93 that the CEO of British Petroleum actually acknowledged that climate change was real and that his company had to do something about it. And John Brown should go down in the legendary books of, of business leadership because he actually did the, the biggest step that he broke ranks with the rest of the oil industry to accept that it was a problem. That was 30, 40 years ago. That was a long time ago. And since then, we should have made a lot more progress than we have. Um, but I guess what we need to do is keep um, moving in the ways that are constructive and helping in the ways that are um, actually taking on solutions to these problems. And I think ignore the guys that are trying to s slow it down and stop it. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know what to say except that um, how do they sleep at night? I mean, there is no doubt that this is happening right now, today. Just look at the U.S., look at climate, in, look at Bangladesh in our neighborhood. I mean, it's real, it's here. Let's figure out how to do something quickly. Let's do it by enabling business that is addressing the issues and by um, letting governments get out of the way when they're stopping us from doing the right thing. How can we further encourage businesses, governments and the public to adopt more environmentally friendly behaviours? Encouraging businesses, governments and communities to adopt more sustainable behaviour is, is really, really important. And as I say, it, it no one of us groups, no, not government, not business, not, not consumers, could actually solve this problem on our own. All of us have to understand we make a choice, and if we understand that we're either part of the problem or we're part of the solution, and actually get on with being part of the solution, regardless of what our hat is as a consumer, as a mother, as a business leader, as a government leader, all of those things have to contribute to the solutions, or they're still contributing to the problem. If we can just identify and, and, and understand that, then every action we take is really obvious. Every action, whether it's I'm riding my bike to school or I'm taking the tram uh, to school, I'm riding my bike to work or I'm taking the tram or I'm driving my car. You know, every action that I take, um, if I consume fair trade products, if I um, don't, you know, these are actions that actually make a difference. And so I think, I think we all understand much better now than we ever did before that what we do matters. And so let's do what matters and let's make that solution part of our way of living and let's not be part of the problem that we, we know and have known for a very long time how to reverse. Do you believe that a cultural approach such as Clean Up Australia Day or a more regulatory approach such as the Green Building Council of Australia is a more effective 
approach to climate change or are both approaches needed? I think we need action across the whole spectrum. And I also think there's a kind of trajectory of change. So I think what happens, um, as I've experienced in the last 30 years, often there are leaders that step out. So the John Browns, the, the CEO of BP, acknowledging that climate change really exists, that changes everything for the rest of his peers and his colleagues. And you step out and then you take action that enables you to be more energy efficient or to do something important that shows a benefit. And then eventually you want the level playing field. So eventually the businesses that actually do lead in some of these things like this, Interface is another great example. In the first year of their sustainability initiatives, they saved 65 million in energy costs and in other cost savings in the business. They then reinvested that in more sustainability stuff. They then looked behind them and said, all right guys, come on, you know, get going. So I think what we need is both leadership where, where um, companies, others are innovative and actually um, addressing the solutions. But eventually what we need is regulation to pull up the rear. So we actually need to get everybody to play by, by these rules. So we have a great example of that right now with modern slavery. So we have had, in fair trade, we've been working for 30 years across supply chains to try to make them transparent, to audit across them, and to make sure that, that the poorest part of our communities in the world are getting a fair go and having a sustainable livelihood. And what we're finding is that actually there's more slavery in the world today than it, there ever was when we were passing slavery laws in the you know, 1800s. So what we need to do now, we have the capability to be transparent. We know what's happening in these supply chains. We actually can eradicate it, but we need everybody to pull together. And so government is actually playing a very constructive role now in the UK. They passed a year ago uh, a Modern Slavery Act. In Australia, they're considering it. They're looking at it in Canada and New Zealand. We need all of these governments to rally and all of these businesses to back it, to say, it's time to get slavery out of supply chains. We have to do this together. So I think we are capable of these kinds of, of transformations. We just have to uh, get together and get organized. There is disagreement between scientists and economists on how much action we should take on climate change. Scientists encourage mitigation until environmentally safe levels, while economists such as Mendelssohn, Nordhaus and Toll recommend economically efficient solutions which involve less mitigation. Which do you agree with? Or are your views more similar to Stern? an economist who pushes for emission reductions to environmentally safe levels. Well, Stern is a hero, and we should acknowledge that um, it's the rare economist that can appreciate um, uh, humbly that economists are wonderful and they have made great contributions to civilization, but actually we can't live without a stable climate. We can change our economy, we can design our economy in many, many different and diverse ways that don't result in climate change. We cannot create um, a, a safe climate by ourselves. So I guess what I would say is that um, we need to understand the biophysical limits of life on Earth and we need to make sure that we're not breaking those rules. The economy we can design in many, many ways and we've gotten better and better at internalizing external costs, at recognizing pollution, at recognizing the kinds of, of, of um, inappropriate ways that the economy can distort. Uh, and is still distorting. I mean, we have more inequality in the world today, uh, more consolidation of huge international banks, um, more poverty than we've ever had. So we need to be able to understand that economics is a, is a creation of our own devices. We can design it well, we can design it poorly. There are examples all over the world of where it works brilliantly. The Grameen Bank is a super one where uh, you can help lift people out of poverty with very simple, small loans that enable women's cooperatives to do something powerful in their community. Or we can uh, enable increased inequality that actually drives more problems and more poverty. I think The Economists, um, and Stiglitz is um, one of the best examples, uh, can help us if they help us to design an economy that respects the boundaries of the biophysical world, and climate is the paramount one. Economics deals with climate change in many different ways. Some outrightly deny that economics has any involvement in climate change, whilst for others, climate change is viewed as a tragedy of the commons and pollution as an externality. But in the words of Stern, it's the biggest market failure the world has ever seen. 
Is there a particular economics approach that you think would work best? For example, cost-benefit analysis, um, a game theory or strategic approach, or viewing mitigation as insurance for climate change? Or should economists stop disputing methods for mitigation when we should really be doing everything in our power to stop climate change? We need to do everything in our power to stop climate change because there will be no economy if we, we don't have a, a, a stable climate. Um, but I think it's also true that um, economics has evolved really substantially in the last 20 years. I actually, when I did my economics degree, I can remember arguing vehemently with my economics professor at Yale, who insisted that the only way to calculate the value of an endangered spotted owl was to calculate the net present value of the timber of the forest in which the, the owl lived. And I said, I don't know how to calculate the value of that owl, but I am absolutely certain that that is a living species that has a value beyond the timber and that we have to figure out as a civilization, what is that value and how do we take that into consideration? Because as Robert Kennedy once said, you know, the economy values everything except what matters. It doesn't matter, it doesn't value, um, it doesn't measure the, the strength of our marriages or the, the, the um, grace in our poetry. It doesn't matter things that really, it doesn't measure things that matter. So what do we do? What do we do? We design an economy that's better and we've gotten much better at this. So for instance, the work of Gretchen Daly, um, looking at um, the value of natural resources in terms of what economic value they, they generate. So for instance, um, they looked at the Catskills. New York City was going to put in a new um, water treatment plant. It was going to cost billions. And they calculated what was the value of this treatment plant over how many years. And what was the cost of just protecting the Catskills water catchment, the mountains, in the, in the mountains around New York, is the water catchment for New York City. And it turned out to be many billions in savings to actually just protect the water catchment than to try to build these water treatment plants that actually were going to fail and have to be rebuilt. And over a period of time, we're going to cost billions more. So in the end, New York was very wise. They protected the water catchment. And, and this recognition that actually there are ecosystem services that have a real economic benefit to humanity and to the world. And because we can't measure them doesn't mean they're not valuable. Um, I think there were beautiful quotes from Native Americans who basically said, you know, man will find that one day he can't eat money. Um, you know, there, there really are things that, that matter more. So I think with economics, we just have to design it to, to um, value the things that actually are essential to life on Earth and to the diversity of life on Earth and to health, healthy life on Earth. Um, and once the economists get to understand those things better, then we'll be able to actually monetize them in different ways. And, and in the case of the Catskills, see that actually letting nature do its work and enabling nature to be healthy is far superior in terms of contributing economic benefits to communities than um, you know, necessarily water treatment technology, for instance. And I guess if I could say one last thing, it would be that what we will see in your lifetime is going to be phenomenal. And I think uh, I'm very hopeful that if we all pay attention and do what matters, we will come out of this and learn a lot from it and be able to be a more civilized and healthier humanity and world. I think, though, that we also have to realize that this is a powerfully challenging time and it matters. So don't think that someone else is going to do it. If we don't do it, we're it. We, are, we, we have seen the enemy and he is us. We have seen the solutions and we can take them. But without all of us, it's, it's not going to be possible. Miss Olsen, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. It really is a pleasure.